is going to correspond to the Metropolis algorithm, <coughs> which we'll talk about later, um, assuming I stay on schedule. And, and this one is going, to, is, is going to talk about the page rank algorithm. There's, there's, there's kind of a third way you can think about it as well. Um, um, you can um, keep track um, of um, the distribution of transitions. Okay, so where, where this one is keeping track of this state QN after n steps, which is a distribution over the states, you can also think of keeping track of PN, which is the which is the uh, what's controlling the uh, um, like how I'm moving after n steps, right? So this p to the n, it, it's this chain together. So this p to the n is p times p times p times p, where you have n of these steps, right? But it's still a single matrix, right? So I had a bunch of matrices, and I'm turning them into a single matrix, which says, if I make n steps, where am I likely to end up? So for many starting stop spot, where am I likely to end up after n steps? And so you can think of keeping track of this as well. Um, from, comp from a computational standpoint, this one is going to be not, not very useful. This is going to be much more expensive. And the, the, we'll, we'll talk more about this, but the reason will be because this uh, usually the matrix P is sparse. So notice all the zeros in here. When you get to much bigger things, there are even more zeros usually. Um, and sometimes you can even define them implicitly without a matrix, and we'll discuss that. Um, whereas this, this QN is going to be dense, but it's only, it's only a vector. This is a full matrix, and this is a vector. So if there are M states, this is size M, this is size um, M squared. And here I'm only keeping track of one node at a time. So this is also um, kind of computationally very easy to do. Um, you have to keep track of more other things in the state to use this, and that may be a challenge, but everything you keep track of will end up being useful, as, as well as we'll talk about. Um, but it's very much easier to implement. Um, well, they're, they're both should be pretty easy to implement, at least on our small enough scale. Okay, so we're going to come back to these two interpretations. So there's a very now, what I want to get to is some very cool properties about P to the N and the state QN and the, and the relation to each other. Um, but in order to really define, define them, it's not always, they're not always going to have these very nice properties I'll talk about. Um, hopefully, I'm, uh, hopefully I'm building the suspense for them. Um, but but they're, they're going to if you have certain conditions on your markup chain. So I need to define these conditions, so I need to spend some time. I know I've just gone through a bunch of definitions, so we're going to do some more, some more definitions. Um, so, okay, so, so that I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll need to walk through some more definitions. Okay, so what should I erase? Keep the graph. So the, this is the definition, the important definition, the now key definition is going to be about ergodic. Right? So um, the V, the Q is ergodic um, if, let's see, um, there exists on some T such that all n greater or equal than T um, has all entries of p to the n non-zero. Okay. 
Okay, um, so what does this mean? Um, this means that if we took more than t steps, we, we started, we, we started um, somewhere in q. Um, and it's going to turn out this, this, in, this, this, this is not going to depend on q, but pick, pick some starting spot q. And we're going to take some n number of steps, and n is large enough. And then all entries are, um, have to be non-zero. Now, this doesn't mean that there is some n such that they're all non-zero, but that all n larger than some t. And there's a slight difference there. Otherwise, you don't quite get the right problem. So for, if you make some large enough number of steps, you could possibly be anywhere in the graph. All right? You could be in any one of your states after some large enough number of steps. And uh, um, that's what this means. OK, so in, in order to really understand the ins and outs of this, it's important to understand the cases uh, of where this is not true. OK, so what are some, what are some cases of Markov chains you could think of? And you should think of them in terms of graphs. They're simpler that where this is not true. Okay, let's let's go through these. So not connected. Right? Um, so this is um, so this is the first thing you said if they um, if the graph is disjoint. And so an example here of the probability transition matrix, which is what's gonna matter, could be if it's like this. And so this corresponds to a a graph with two states, and each state can just go to itself. Right, so you can have self loops. Right, you could also think of this uh, more generally, where uh, right, and so this corresponds to having these four nodes, and these two are connected, and these two are not connected. And you can think of more complicated examples. Right, if you start at any one of these locations then there's no possible way to get to one of these locations after any number of steps. You're never going to get there. You're always going to bounce back and forth. OK, so this, so this is the first one. So we want our graph to be connected. We want, and in general, we want our probability transition matrix to be connected. You can always get everywhere and, uh, if you go long enough. OK. Um, uh, um, the second one you said if there are um, leaf nodes, right? So, so I'll make this a little bit. The, the terminology you usually use is there are um, transient and absorbing um, nodes. Um, so a transient node, I think, is, is, is what you mean by leaf nodes, right? So, so an example of this would be um, If you had a matrix that looks like uh, zero, one, okay, so, uh, so <coughs> what's going to happen here? You're going to have A, and A is always your A, B, and C, and A is always going to move to B, B is always going to move to A, and C is also is always going to move to. Is always going to move to B. Okay, so if you start at A, you can always you can you can get to B, and from B you can get back to A. All that's fine, but you could get from if you started in C, you're going to wind up in B, and then you're never going to be able to get out of this A and B. Right? You, you, you can think of things even even larger than this. Right? You can think of having um, say A, B, C. Um, D, and you can have a, uh, um, um, something like uh, um, E and F, and so let's say F always goes to E, E goes to F with probability 99 out of 100, A, B, C, and D, these always go uh, maybe one half here one half here, 
A always goes to B, and B um, one half up this way and one half this way. Um, but then you have one out of 100 out of this E and F, you're going to wind up in, in, in this part. So if you started in F, it's going to have, you're always going to go to E, and you're usually going to come back to F. But sometimes it's going to seep out. Sometimes you're going to seep out and go to A. Once you get to A, you always are stuck in this area. You can never get back into here. So it, it's, it's not that you always go out of this state, but you have some probability of getting out. And once you go out, you can't ever come back in. So these nodes uh, 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 these are called transient because you're kind of so when you're transient when you're in a transient part of your life I guess you're kind of wandering around aimlessly and you'll eventually wander out into uh, and you know like you'll you'll finally grow up and get a job and start a family or something right so I'm, I imagine some of you have been maybe called that by your parents at some point. <laughs> well, probably something like that, but not, uh, you know, they probably didn't call you transients, but they, yeah, but, but that would maybe would have been appropriate. Um, so, and then these other states um, here and A and B here, um, um, these are called absorbing because once they, take the probability from these states, once they grab this thing, it um, this never lets you go. Right? So the, 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 this becomes, you know, you're always in this part of the state space afterwards. So um, a transient uh, a transient node is one that you can you, you basically get away from, but it's hard to ever get back to. Is that is that a good well, it's, it's not that it's hard to ever get back to, it's that you can't ever get back to it. So instead of here, looks like I messed this up. This um, so it looks like D could never go anywhere. But let's say D always goes to, to C. But, but let's say this was, you know, 9999 out of 10,000, right? And then you have one state here, one out of 10,000, a very unlikely event, right? Then you like wouldn't be considered transient. Then these are no longer transient, and these are no longer absorbing. You can you can get everywhere, right? So so this is like you know um, so what happens after you get married and have kids, but then you know uh, um, and this was your fun part of your life, whatever. And then you, um, um, and then after you win the lottery, you know you you, you know I don't know things change. You get back to having fun again. You can hire a manager or something. I don't know. Um, all right. So, so, so if, if you do this, then it's not transient or absorbing. But um, let me fix this. So, we get one number wrong. So going back to something. So I guess you can't have transient without being absorbing as well. Like you can't have a right. transient node without having an absorbing node as a sort of collection as well. Yeah. I mean, I guess you could say that. Um, like if if it's these are undirected, they're all absorbing, right? And there are no transient states. So, but in general, you say you have some transient and some absorbing nodes. And so this is also a condition where you don't satisfy the ergodic property, right? Because you know um, if there's no n large enough where you're if you started, you know anywhere here, if if um so. So I, I guess this means um, maybe for all, by for all Q. Because if, if Q started here, then you, uh, there's always some positive probability you're in half of E. But this is, is, is going to zero. In the limit, it's going to go to zero. Um, OK, so, so, th so these are two possible conditions where you're not ergodic. Um, there's there's one more condition you need to worry about.
And this is a this is actually a, a graph you can draw, an undirected graph with two nodes. Now, if you, if you think of, let's see, so if you draw a graph with two nodes, you can think of it as this matrix with only four entries in it, and they each need to sum up to one. And so in fact, I'm not gonna have any, any self loops, right? So then, it's just gonna be this graph. Why is this graph not absorbed? Uh, or what, excuse me, why is this graph not organic? Why is this graph not organic? So, if you start in on the left, you know, you call it a state, you have probability one to be in, and then you have probability one to be in. Right. So, so what happens is, let's say I started in node A, and then after a million steps, right, after, after a million steps, what is Q going to look like? I'm going to give you a hint, a million is even. Yeah, it'll be an A. It's always going to be an A. You have no probability of being B. What happens after a million and one steps? You're always going to be in B, you're never an A. So this is the third condition. This is called the cyclic. So if you have these cycles of it, right? So you, you know, more commonly you can have you know, a cycle of length three. So you could be in, in three notes here. Um, but is this graph cyclic if, it's, um, if this is not directed? Right. So you have to have this one be directed. So if you're in A, then every third step, if you start in A, then every third step, you're always in A. But if it's going back and forth, then it's, um, so if, if I can go from B back to A again, like it's not, Right, then, the, then I can, in the, after two steps, I can be back in A or I could be in C. And I could have also been in B because I could have gone from A to C to B. So after two steps, I've already, I'm already have a non-zero chance to be everywhere. Right, and, and from, and, and that's gonna continue, in fact. So, so if, if it's undirected, then for, um, if T is two, then it's, uh, um, then it already satisfies the circuit. Okay, so how about how about this graph? Um, Why is this not our guy? Well, because there's a probability from A going to B or D, so you, you don't know that N equals until you where it could be because you switch off either time. At least I think. Okay, so I have two parts here. This part is has a cycle of length three. This part is a cycle of length two. Right, so is it so, so? So it's simple just to do with a simple thought experiment, right? So if I start in A, can I be in A after one step? No. So if I start in A, can I be in A after two steps? No. Yeah, you can. You can go to D and then back to A. Can I be in A after three steps? Yeah, you can go around this one. So then, um, for any step after three. Um, can I be in B? Starting in three, I can be there in three steps by going D, A, D again. Or I can be there in four steps by going A, B, C, A, D. Right, so, so once you break the cycle, then you're no longer sick. Right, so, so this graph is not sick. Right, so these are, like, this one, once I make it direct to the sick, like, this one is not. Even though it's the combination of these two cyclic graphs. But couldn't we determine the pattern of what the, the second graph is there? I mean, it seems like we could come up with some heuristic on what it could be at any time, like the probability of us being D or probability of us being C or, or B or C, given the 
the integer number that we're at, right? It's not integer. Uh, right. So you you could actually you can actually solve explicitly for p to the n threat animation. You can work out the probabilities, and there there are many there 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 are many ways you can do it. Um, one is you just do exactly what I was doing here. You start from a certain state and you walk forward, and and that tells you you just calculate after after seven steps you have q seven, and that tells you exactly your probability of the states. The other way is you can take this matrix P, which you can write down for this, and you can take it to the power seven, and then you can say, you know, for a mini Q, I just need to look at this this uh, this matrix P to P to the power seven, and I know what the probability is, right? And it's it's going to be dense if it's if this zirconic is going to be dense. Um, and so, in fact, if I know I started in in one of the states, that was one. I just need to look at this column. That column tells me the probability I'm in that state. If I started, um, if I started, if I started in this fourth state here in state D, then after seven steps, if this is P to the seven, this column tells me the probability I'm in this the, the other state. So could we say that it's ergodic, ergodic if um, with a probability of one hundred percent, we can determine what state it will be in? Yeah, so you can do that even if it's not ergodic. You can calculate the probability exactly by, by going through this technique. So this does not depend on it being ergodic, by just this push forward um, So, but the, one of the, the reason I outline these three things is these are the only three conditions you need to worry about. If the graph is connected, if it has no transient or absorbing nodes, and if it's not cyclic, it must be ergodic. Right, so you just need to look at these three properties. If they're satisfied, then you know it's ergodic. Okay, and, and this 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 ergodic thing is cool um, because what it says um, is that um, so. So the reason this is cool um, is because, so you can write this as Q star equals P star times Q. This P star is also converted, which means that it does not depend on Q. Any starting state, you'll have the same final distribution if you take enough steps. So that's, okay, that's kind of this life lesson too here. So if you take one step at a time, you will eventually get there. And there is the this limiting state. So just one of these states at a time, you will eventually get to this limiting uh, distribution Q star. Okay. So this is, is, is cool, but if you, you can think of it as Q star is also going to equal to, this means this is for any state, means Q star times p um, times q, or actually you can write this as p, p star q, right? This is equal to q star is equal to p star q star, right? So if you're at this limiting state, your distribution is this, oh wait, this was Right, you take one step, you're still at this limiting state. Right, so this is kind of the, you're not changing your distribution anymore as you make these steps forward. Um, right, so, so once you get here, 
um, you can stop. The chain is not doing this. Now this is in the limit, so it may never actually get there, but it'll get close enough that you, that you basically can't tell. But if you're in this limiting state, then you're you know, going to get, then applying another step is not going to do anything. Okay, so, um, so who's taking linear algebra? Right, okay, so, so, so what, is, what is going on here? Right, right. Um, so Q, <clears throat> Q star is an eigenvector of P. So the, um, an eigenvector is a, is a is a vector. Well, I put a one here, right? And then if you multiply. There's some scalar, which is the corresponding eigenvalue, right? That if you multiply this vector times a matrix, it's equal to some scalar times this matrix. This is a special property. This is called the eigenvalue. And so that means that if you have this matrix, you can use your linear algebra technique to solve for um, the eigenvectors. And that will tell you a few stuff. That will tell you this, this, this limiting state. Right, so instead of going through this process step by step um, and seeing where it winds up, right, you can just use, you know, um, just use MATLAB or whatever to solve for the eigenvector, and that tells you the same. That's the technique that would use that would iterate the dominant eigenvector. So unless you have a really small eigenvector. Yeah. You can solve directly for Q star, but it's, it's solving it. So there are there are certain cases where you can solve for it more efficiently. Um, so my linear algebra is, is, uh, is blanking, but there are some, and, and, and you you can do like Gaussian elimination um, to to solve for this as well. And, and maybe that's not how you do it on a very large scale, but if you did that, you would essentially be solving for it um, exactly. I mean, now. So if you're if you're taking linear algebra, or especially numerical linear algebra, you, you know it's not actually exactly, but you know from a, it has a has a closed form solution, which is which is cool. Um, unless that closed form involves you know have to do dividing, it, and then it's actually not so cool. Um, but right. Um, okay. So um, so so it means you can. Instead of implementing this yourself, when you do the step forward, you can you can use these linear algebra tools, and they will either do Gaussian elimination or something more robust, which may actually be iterating this process to solve this for you. So you can just use MATLAB to go and solve for this this uh, this dominant eigenvector of of this properly transition matrix here, right? And so this so also to Remember this property, where once you're in this final state, you're you're transitioning back to this final state. And so, so what is this saying? This is saying that if you're at a node in in your graph in this state, the probability of transitioning out of this node, the probability that you're in this node and you transition out, is the same probability that you're in another node and you transition in. Right, so if, if you think of this as karma, if you're giving away, you know, um, you know, favors to someone, people are going to give you equal favors in return. Right, so that's this this uh, third life lesson. Right, so you're in the, in, the, in the limit. See, in the limit there, that final state, everyone has has perfect karma. Right, so everything <coughs> you give out, you get back in return. So that's unless they're transient and absorbing. There's, there's someone who's greedy, and these people, you know, have, have extra good karma somehow. Actually, so that doesn't. So that's probably true in life, unfortunately. But, you know, well, we can think that life is actually organic. Okay. This is just a little off topic, but I mean, that seems like a principle that sociologists could use to kind of study human behavior, build, I don't know, graphs out of. Possibly, if you could quantify karma, that is. Um, uh, I. I don't know if you're living in a coke commercial, right? <laughs> and maybe that's 
and it's true you can quantify the number of pokes passed or something. But, um, yeah, so I, I, I'm not sure if, if sociologists have such this. It's, it's possible, it's possible, it's not, I don't know. I just look at it because I've worked with a bunch of companies, like some large corporations, and I just see like yeah, how the political structure works out, and it really depends on how, you know, the, the, how people network with each other and how they're set up politically, you know, whether they rise or fall in companies, really based on what they do with other people. And I don't know, in a way, it kind of seems like if you look at a person who's really high up in the company, they probably network a lot and end up a lot that way. I, I don't know. So actually, as we'll see, in the final state, now this final state, Q star, is not, is not a uniform distribution. Some states have higher probability than others. These states are more, more important in the, in the connection. People keep coming back to those states. So building connections allows you to be more influential. And not always, you don't always need a lot of connections, but you need the right connections in order to do this. And so there's a lot of, there's been, been research in how to kind of think of how to, how to optimize your, your connections in a graph. Or if you look at, if you're looking at a graph, which ones are most, most connected? So this is going to be related to the page rank, as we'll see, um, I guess that's on next week. All right, so, so what are we, 10 minutes left, all right. Um, okay, so, um, so that's, that's basically what I want to tell you about Markov chain. So these are the coolest properties here. If you keep iterating, if you satisfy these fairly reasonable um, conditions about being or got it, but you need to satisfy them, then you're going to eventually get to the state Q star. In the limit, you will get here. And I don't know how long the limit is, but you'll eventually get there. Now, you can look, it's going to depend on, um, it, it's, it's, going to be, it's going to depend on when you, um, on, on actually what the second um, eigenvalue is. So this is, So, I forget the naming convention, but when you when you solve for this, there's there's like a the first eigen the first eigenvector I believe is it's going to be boring, and this corresponds with the second eigenvector, and and this one the value of the eigenvalue here, um, eigenvalue here is always one. So the, so the next eigenvalue down is going to determine how quickly you converge. You have to wait for that one to kind of disappear. As you keep iterating this, the, the eigenvalue tells you how much you're you're dissipating that part of the, of the distribution. And um, so, so if you know the second eigenvalue, you can say how long it will take to converge. But it takes just as long to calculate that second eigenvalue as it does to actually converge. So it, it doesn't really help you. So if you're given a thing automatically and don't know anything about it ahead of time, then you're not clear how long this is going to take in the limit to converge. Um, but it will, it will converge. And in practice, so, I mean, in practice depends on what your practice is, right? But in some cases, people say if you do like a thousand steps, that'll be good. And we'll see for pagering, because they can use some tricks, they only need like, on like 50 steps. They're going to do something like this. Okay, so, all right, so the last thing, the last 10 minutes, I want to talk about the metropolis of it. Um, so, so a few people have heard of the metropolis of it, right? So, so, so who had heard of the metropolis of it? Right, so, so this was, so, so, so do you remember where this was, um, when this was invented? Was the history of it? You heard about that? So um, the Metropolis algorithm was actually due to five, it was, it was written in a paper by five people. Um, um, by Metropolis, um, by Feller, and Feller, which was a husband and wife team, and by Rosenblut, um, and Rosenblut. Um, um, another husband and wife. Why would they call Metropolis and not Taylor and Rosenblut? Well, 
Um, that's a good question. So, that's like the oh, wait, wait, hold on, hold on. It was, sorry. Um, this was Teller. Um, and so, these actually came later. So, there was the names were alphabetical. Now, there's some controversy over who actually did more work on that. Some people say it was actually Metropolis. Other people say it was, was one of the tellers. Um, there depends on your version of history. Um, so but this was developed in like the 1950s, and they were at um, Los Alamos trying to do simulations for the atomic bomb. <coughs> and this algorithm was how do you use to calculate very complicated scenarios, complicated pro probabilities, and they had no other way of doing it. And they used some synchronous tricks and some kind of theory of Markov chains, but that was not really that formalized yet. A lot of this theory about the ergodic stuff. They, but they could, they, they, they came up with this algorithm um, to try and simulate these probabilities. So now, um, so it was called to his, at the Metropolis. This was like in uh, 53, and then in um, there was Hastings in 1970, and he said you can also use this algorithm to do a lot of the more general simulation of probabilities. And then in the, in the late 80s, early 90s, there was, um, um, there was Gemin and Gemin, who weren't husband and wife, these two were brothers. This was in 84. <laughs> and then there's, there's another influential paper by Gelfin and, uh, <laughs> no, 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 and Smith, and I think they were unrelated. Um, this was in '90, but but these papers said you can use this to calculate uh, um, these Bayesian probabilities, and so most of so it, this is when it was called MC um, MC, and this is what most of Bayesian statistics when they're trying to calculate the probability distribution of a certain. Um, of, of a distribution, they, they use this metropolis Hastings technique or this MCMC technique to do it. And so this it was this long chain of events. This was done in, in these people are all in on physics, but they're also using the first computers. And so they didn't know how to calculate.